Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our diabetes wellness group. Thank you so much for joining. We're so happy to have you um, this evening. We have such a great treat in store for you tonight. We're going to learn how to prepare some um, local um, ingredients and some things that are around spring cooking and seasonal foods as we have this beautiful weather, see all of our mountains and hills green, um, we'll be able to bring that into our kitchen as well. Um, so today we have Anna Simos, who's our diabetes care program manager um, and really the visionary um, for this diabetes program at Stanford Healthcare. So we can attribute that to Anna and her hard work and her dedication um, diabetes educator. And then we also have Megan Sosnick who has her a master's of science in management and entrepreneurship. Um, and so she actually has a great story that Anna and Megan had told me before that when she was going through her master's class, she actually started cooking for everyone and teaching people about real ingredients and how to assemble them. So I'm just picturing all these master's students um, pouring over the books and having amazing foods that Megan's helping cook, things that are nutritious and helping really um, with our studies and everything. So we're excited to have them here today to teach us some more about some of those healthy brain foods for spring. Thanks, Leah. Thanks. Okay, welcome everyone. So let's jump into the spring spirit and get going with some really fun ingredients and recipes. Um, I guess Megan, what do you want to start with today? Let's start assembling the salmon so that it can cook while we go over putting together the blood orange avocado salad and then talking about our really fun, simple dessert. So let me go grab the salmon from the fridge. So all of these um, recipes are posted. Um, Leah, should they be having, should they have them already or are they going to get them afterwards? The recipes will be available afterwards, um, okay. as well as the recording. Okay, perfect, perfect. So you will have these recipes afterwards and they're all um, healthy, heart healthy, um, nutritious recipes, which have carb counts and are appropriate for people with diabetes or without diabetes. And which is a fun thing is that you can, this, these meals you can make for the entire family or these foods. So, um, we're starting with the orange pomegranate salmon. And um, salmon is a really great fish. It's, um, it has the omega fatty acids. It has, of course, protein, and it's a really healthy fish. And Leah, is there anything else you want to talk about about why we think salmon's great? Yeah, no, I think you definitely covered it. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and here we go. Megan? Hi, right, perfect. So we can go over some of our ingredients first. So we know that when cooking salmon, cost always comes into play, especially here in the Bay Area where we are. But I was able to find today some farm fresh salmon that was over two pounds for $34. So that's something that could definitely feed four or five people or be a good meal prep and it is fresh, but they also had lots of options for wild frozen and you can get that at Walmart, Costco, I saw it at Safeway. So lots of good options. And then we have some thinly sliced onions here that will go underneath for a pretty garnish. We have our sliced oranges to give really great flavor, some pomegranate, that will drizzle over before we cook. And then we have our finely diced dill right here. And then we also have the option of subbing the pomegranate seeds if someone is on a medication where they can't have pomegranates or you just don't like it, you could use dried cranberries, you could use currants, raisins, anything to add a little bit of color and sweetness. And so now we will take out the salmon. And like Megan said, um, with, in regards to frozen pieces, you can get, those are also good because they're portion controlled. Typically they're built in por one portion sizes. So there's that option as well. 
the um, other great thing is, is that with the orange, you get a little bit of your vitamin C in there. And also we're using olive oil, which is a um, monosaturated fat and is heart healthy. That's beautiful. A nice big piece. And then, so we're going to put a little bit of olive oil on top of the salmon. And I've already sprayed the tin foil with olive oil spray because it's important to also be conscious of what oils you're cooking with because there is a big debate about what oils are healthy right now. And then we are going to sprinkle with a little bit of salt and pepper. And what's nice about this dish is it's a really nice festive looking dish that you can have, make it for, you know, for, an, you know, when you're having people over and it, it just looks beautiful. Yeah, you already have a question. Um, somebody is asking for the audience, is wild salmon healthier than farm salmon? Well, you know, that's a good question. We talked about it actually today. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that actually either, and Leah, please chime in. Um, I, I think that actually wild salmon, there is a quite, isn't it supposedly Leah, cause you are the, the RD, that it is a little bit healthier, the wild salmon, and it does taste a little different. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, like Megan highlighted so well, the cost of foods are definitely rising. And so um, this is a great option. It's farm salmon, but um, definitely the cost, you'll get a lot of healthy, um, fat omega fatty acid benefits. But when we look at farmed um, versus wild salmon, the fish are having to travel for longer periods of time. They have more lean mass versus um, higher fatty um, tissue. And so it's just gonna be a little bit different um, of a dynamic for the fish. Um, and the omega fatty acids will be a little bit higher. But I don't think that if farm raised is the thing that you see and the thing that's in your budget, you definitely should not avoid it. It still has a lot of great heart benefits. Thanks, Leah. And so lastly, before we throw the salmon in the oven, and you can see how we've assembled it here, it in the recipe, it calls for adding a second piece of foil on top. So I'm just going to grab that before we throw that in the oven. And the prep time on this is 10 minutes approximately, and you bake it for um, 25 minutes. Is that correct? 25 to 30 yeah. minutes at 375. And it's really important to bring the edges together on the tin foil to hold everything in together right here. So we have the oven already and we're going to pop it in and it is 510 now. So we're going to check on it in about 20 minutes at 530 to make sure that we're on track. And you can cook it to any desired temperature that you'd like, though. Okay. All right. So the next, um, the next item on our menu is the blood orange avocado salad. Um, the we're we're lucky because actually Megan did the prep work. It says prep work is thirty minutes plus chilling. Um, but she did that ahead of time. And this, this salad in its um, entirety makes 10 servings. What's really nice about this is that um, a serving, even with the avocado is like 241 calories. Um, but the carbs is, you know, it, is, it does have um, 24 grams of carbs, but that's mostly because of, I believe the blood orange, it still is a great salad. And, the avocado has such great monosaturated fats in it. It's, you know, people, it, it, it's, it's heart healthy. It's a good, it's nice. Um, it also, the, these fats also, from a perspective of diabetes, help stabilize the impact of the carbohydrate in your bloodstream. So this is, you know, it's a nice pairing with um, a meal. 
And so while Anna has been talking, I've started the dressing and you're going to put together the first eight ingredients on the ingredient list for the blood orange avocado salad. So you can see I'm using this olive oil here. And then I don't personally drink a lot of orange juice. So I just bought a little tiny orange juice to, for this dressing. So it's a third of a cup of orange juice, a third of a cup of extra virgin olive oil, and three tablespoons of lime juice. And you can use something like this that's already pre-squeezed together. You can use a fresh lime, whatever you have in your refrigerator. But this is nice for quick and convenience. Yeah, this is a really nice dressing. And it's really nice to have um, if you can make fresh dressings. I think that's a really nice healthy option because it takes it eliminates a lot of the preservatives you see in bottle dressings. Now we're adding the two tablespoons of honey. For a more natural sweetness. And although two tablespoons of honey might sound a lot to people who have diabetes, you have to realize that this is coming over 10 servings of, um, of salad. And then lastly, we're going to throw in the different seasonings and parsley. So the next piece is the one tablespoon of Italian uh, parsley a quarter teaspoon of ground cardamom, um, a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt, and a quarter teaspoon of coarsely ground pepper. So here is parsley. Cardamom's a nice addition to this for the dressing. I think it gives it a little really zing. Good. Yeah. Really fresh. Yeah. This is really not only is it good for a springtime salad, this is a really good summer salad too. Salt too. Uh, yeah, a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt. Perfect. And then we'll just have to whisk this together. Homemade salad dressings, I really think, are a great way to eliminate some of the extra preservatives, salts, and um, and just things that we don't need fillers in our um, when we're eating salad. So it's nice to be able to have a good dressing like this, but also even experimenting with other dressings. I mean, it's, and also it's actually cost effective to make your own dressing. Salad dressings are expensive. So you can see that it's put together and it just combines and the parsley and the other seasonings are just floating in the dressing. So you'll be able to toss it all together once we're done. That looks so delicious. <laughs> also, if you're thinking about um, with your meal, having something like beans or lentils in your meal, all of that ascorbic acid or vitamin C really helps you to absorb the iron in your plant-based foods. So I think that's a great salad dressing that you could use in lots of different ways. Well, that's a great idea. Leah, I didn't even think about that. Thank you. And so now we've brought over the rest of the ingredients and I've already prepped everything but the avocados just because avocados typically turn brown if you do it too much in advance, but you could always put some lime juice on them to help keep them green. But you can see here, I have the four grapefruits and I have them cubed and I did the ruby red and then just a traditional red because they didn't have all of them in the grocery store and I figured why not add some more pretty color to the salad and then here you can see the blood orange and so we're just going to throw that in here and it was nice because when you're cutting it you're getting rid of all the seeds in the skin anyways and look at how beautiful that is 
It's really pretty. And then next, we just need half a cup of the chopped red onion. Here we go. And you can, if you really like onion, you can use more, but we had a full onion here. And then lastly, the pomegranate seeds, more pomegranate seeds. And again, you can actually substitute those. You could actually even use um, raspberries instead of pomegranate seeds if you'd like. Um, one thing to consider with the grapefruit, if you are if you're on a medication that is sensitive to and you're told not to eat grapefruit, you can always do the salad with different a different citrus, like an orange or something else. I mean, Leo, what would be another good um, uh, another good uh, substitute for the grapefruit? If someone could not have a uh, grapefruit in their diet. Yeah, I think the orange and the lime, like Megan had added the lime in, um, will give it that tangier flavor. So I go heavier on lime and a little bit lighter on the orange so that you don't have something as sweet. Okay. Okay, so now we've added the cheese and the pomegranates as well. And last but not least, just the avocados. And then we'll chill the salad. We thought this was a great salad. We saw this salad in the winter when we were considering what we would make. And it, it just such a yummy salad. I'm just so pretty and festive for this time of year. And if you wanted to add arugula or some type of lettuce, you definitely could, or even just use it for decoration under salad. Yeah, it's um, that's an that is another option is if you wanted to add something in there. Even spinach, you can put a little mm -hmm. bit of spinach underneath it. That'd be pretty. Does anyone out there in uh, webinar land have any questions? Yeah, actually, just as you asked, somebody did. Um, they were asking about what type of cheese was used and what came before the honey and the dressing. Um, was it olive oil or vinegar? It was olive oil. It was a third cup olive oil and a third cup orange juice. Um, and then we are using feta cheese. Thank you. And again, these recipes will be available after the webinar so that you guys, there's a, I think there's recipes and I think that we have a shopping list too. Mm -hmm. yeah, so to help you, you in the store. Yeah, so if you wanna make this meal, um, we have a little shopping list to help you. Oh, somebody else is asking if the salad dressing can be made ahead of time and just used in the week. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, and that's the neat thing about this is that, you know, People are afraid to make their own salad dressings. And I just really, and Leah chime in. I mean, honestly, I'm a big proponent of making your own salad dressing. Cause when I go to the store and I, I pull up even a one that's actually in the refrigerator cap case. And I look at the sodium alone in these salad dressings. It's really amazing. What, how much sodium can be in two tablespoons of a salad dressing. So that's why I think it's a lot, it's a better option to be able to control your sugars and your salts and, and even your fats by making your own salad dressing. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. And we have some other webinars that we did last year too um, on some different salad dressings with Andrea Wolf, one of our other dietitians, and Kina right. Judge, one of our APPs. Um, so you can check those out too if you want some other salad dressing options. They've been pre recorded. That's right. Uh, Katie did one, especially on summer salads. I think it was something. And it was those were really good. That was another. All of the webinars are really great. I mean, we're so lucky. We have such a good team here. Oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. So it's all come together. We're gonna leave the dressing off for now, and it will allow everyone to use as much dressing or as little as they want. Because honestly, you might not even need dressing with this. 
and we're going to chill it and it's just for about an hour, but I'm sure you could do less if you just want to eat as soon as the salmon's done, but we're going to put it in the fridge for now. Okay, great. Thanks. And then someone's asking for a carb count for the salad versus the dressing. Um, so we can make sure we'll have that on the, the recipes that we send out. Is that all right? Yeah, I think we'll we'll have to figure that out. But um, so the total carbs is 24 grams. But you know what? That's a great point is that we do not have, they don't have the salad dressing versus, that's interesting. That's interesting. So we can figure it out. No problem. So um, last and then, but not least, dessert. Oh, and before dessert. we get to dessert, we have one more quick question. Okay. <laughs> very excited about your salad. Um, there is, is there a rule to salad making in regards to oil portion versus vinegar portion? Um, and then if we have any comments on creamy dressings. Um, so, you know, I was always taught like, um, you know, I was taught oftentimes like with a balsamic or a Greek dressing, I, I do like olive oil to vinegar was very like almost it was. And then there was some, I, I would almost do like a two to one with some lemon and pepper, but that my heritage is Greek. Um, so that is what I was taught by my grandmother. But um, Leah, do you have any rules of thumb when it comes to like the, the oil versus vinegar? Um, I don't. I just go by taste um, and see what I like taste wise. But I definitely normally do. Um, I personally do a little bit more vinegar than olive oil yeah. um, and add different acids like lemons and garlic and stuff like that. Um, and then the second part of the question about the creamy dressings, I think that um, it's all about portions too. So if you're somebody who loves blue cheese dressing or ranch dressing yeah. and you want to add it to your salad, it's going to get you to eat those greens um, and you do one or two tablespoons, that's <laughs> definitely fine. It's definitely fine. I wouldn't forgo the salad be just because you think it's a creamy dressing. But of course, we normally recommend oil-based dressings first. But um, if you love your blue cheese, I'd say go for it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Megan, do you have anything about like um, portions of like oil to vinegar on salad dressings? I haven't done that personally, but I really like the dressings and you guys can chime in Walden Farms because they have no sugar, fat, oil, yeah. or starch. Because I did a diet once that needed all of those rules and I loved it and I would marinate chicken with it, fish, and it was really nice because you don't have to think about a lot. Okay. Well, there we go. There's a, there's, that's a really great tip. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, dessert. <laughs> dessert is a four ingredient cookie and it is, it's a, and it is, um, it's a lower carb option. It's almost could be a keto cookie. Um, and it's um, one cookie, I believe has 12 grams of carb and, but they're not small and um, 196 calories and it's peanut butter chocolate chip cookie. And so you can see the ingredients that we use. We were able to find in the store the extra crunchy Skippy natural. And it was honestly a little bit difficult to find in the peanut butter section. Um, but it's nice because it's a really good product that's more similar to regular peanut butter. Um, and it works really well for baking. And then it, one of the other products that you're supposed to use is the Swerve. And it calls for the brown sugar Swerve, but the store was out. So we actually just used the regular granulated sugar and the cookies turned out just fine. Yep. Um, and then next we have... Lily's semi-sweet baking chips and they're less sugar and they still have really great taste. They're made with stevia and they're 45% cacao. And then it calls for one egg and then an optional of uh, coarse salt, if you'd like yeah. to top it. And so we have a cookie ready to go. <laughs> we oh. How long did it take to um, bake? It was. It only took about ten minutes. Yeah, it was ten min minutes, and it was quick, easy to put together. We popped it on the um, on the cookie sheet, 
he popped it down with the fork like a peanut butter cookie you would and here you go and it looks beautiful and it's nice because with the paint the crunchy peanut butter it has really good texture to it and the egg is what holds it together it has no flour which is unusual for cookies um and it's just a really soft gooey cookie and i would say don't take them off the cookie sheet until they've completely cooled because they are so tender yeah and that that's an interesting point that it, the fact that we you know i was thinking about it leah the fact that it has no flour in it this would almost be um mm -hmm. this is gluten-free too isn't it yeah it would be gluten-free so this cookie covers a lot of a lot of territory in different diets and it's a really nice tasty cookie and you don't feel like it's a no offense diabetic cookie where you have that sugar free aftertaste um, even in the lily chocolate chips there was a um, the stevia didn't have an aftertaste I actually did try a chocolate chip I had to quality control it and um, <laughs> it it really did. Um, it really was like a normal semi-sweet chocolate chip. So a uh, big uh, thumbs up for Lily's chocolate chips. And while we're waiting on the salmon, do we have any other questions? I think we've answered them all so far. So if anyone has questions, please um, put them in the Q&A or in the chat, whichever one you want. Um, I think maybe it's a good time to also Maybe like if you want to both share a story about where your sort of love of finding these more local and seasonal ingredients came from. I can start. <laughs> uh, for me, as Leah spoke in the beginning, I did my master's in Boston and coming from California and living purely in California, except for doing a study abroad prior to moving to Boston, I totally took advantage of farm to table because that is so common here in the Bay Area. And I would have to really plan and think about what was seasonal, what was fresh, where it was coming from, because when you're eating local and fresh, the ingredients taste so much better. So that dictated what I was cooking and who I was cooking for. So that changed my outlook because I really took advantage of lovely California cuisine. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, very similar to Megan. I've always lived in California and I've always loved um, of the fresh local produce going to um, farmers markets and experimenting with different things like, you know, um, I remember when I first saw dinosaur kale, I was like, it looked really pretty and I had no idea what I was gonna do with it, but I had to buy it. I figured I'd just put in a vase if I, I, you know, it was so neat. But, you know, learning how to just try something different and then realizing that it's fun to eat seasonally. And there is a reason we do eat certain things during the season. First of all, they taste better. Second of all, think about how our body works. Like in, in, the, in the colder times, in the winter, we're drinking, we're eating soups, we're, we're eating differently than in the winter in the summer times and how we kind of go through the seasons and I feel like following that type of path is a really it's not only um nutritious and healthy it's fun it's something to look forward to and so um that's why I think seasonal foods are um and trying to eat seasonally and integrating it versus always eating the same thing is something neat to do and something to look forward to so um, that's why I was very excited when um, Megan and I got this opportunity because springtime is when everything is waking up and there's all these new things to look at. So yeah, thanks Leah, that, that was a good question. And here you can see I'm removing the foil because oh, the outside of the salmon has cooked but we can still see that after the 20 minutes, we still mm -hmm. need to cook some more because it is quite a large piece. Right. Um, but you can see how it's going, but I'm going to remove the foil so that hopefully it cooks a little bit faster. Yeah. And it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful to have that out on a table on a platter for our dinner with this salad. And then I don't know, you could make you could serve these cookies with maybe some vanilla ice cream. Just yummy. 
Is there any more questions? <laughs> I think um, not right now. Oh, actually, I think one just popped in. Um, they are wondering about the effects of artificial sweeteners on health. Um, and then if some are better than others, and then if only people living with diabetes should use them or other people should as well. Well, people, I mean, so artificial sweeteners are used for not just for people with diabetes, people who are looking to do weight loss, um, sometimes choose to um, decrease some of their caloric intake by using artificial sweeteners. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about that. Things such as um, stevia is a natural artificial sweetener, um, monk fruit. Some of these sweeteners also that are more natural and considered not an artificial sweetener, but an alternative. Um, there's even a, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the, um, have you seen it, Leah, the birch sugar sweetener? There's one that's, um, you can get it at um, like, uh, a, like a Whole Foods. But these, these, some of them actually really do act like sugar. Like monk fruit, I see, um, I mean, I'm very transparent. I have type 1 diabetes. So I've tried pretty much every sweetener out on the market. And I can tell you, some are a lot better to bake with than others. Like, if you're going to try to bake with saccharin, everything's going to probably turn into a rock. It just doesn't bake well. But there are other ones out there that are pretty good. I mean, sometimes with Splenda, you can cook very easily with Splenda. And then with Swerve, there, there's a lot more options. Some of the issues, though, if, you're, if you notice, are the taste, the aftertaste. So it has to be tried. In regards to NutraSweet and the questions between NutraSweet and saccharin, I have looked at those studies and those studies, the people who are drinking large amounts of Diet Coke or in taking consum consuming large, I mean, very large amounts um, daily, that's where you might see a problem. But if you're just using it in a cookie or, um, you know, uh, making like some pudding, it most likely won't affect you. I mean, that's my personal feeling. Um, Leah, do you have any comments? Yeah, I think this is a great question and definitely a hot topic. Um, we have a lot more um, kind of artificial sugars on the market now because of the increase in some of these different fad diets. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of uh, look at them in different classes. So we have sugar alcohols, which are your alls like sorbitol, xylitol, urethritol. So Swerve um, also has urethritol in it um, as well because it gives it like a little bit more sugar-like taste. And so these are... Um, basically molecules that have um, different additions like OH is added onto them. So our bodies don't truly absorb them like they would a sugar, but our bodies also register them as sweet. Um, sometimes some of them can give us a little bit of gas and bloating because half of it's digested um, and the other half ends up in our gut and our digestive tract and the bacteria in our gut speed off of it rapidly and we can have some uh, GI issues. So I would just try all that for yourself, maybe in a time when you're not going out to hang out with others, <laughs> if you're trying a new sugar alcohol, um, but their taste profile is better. And then um, there has been some more preliminary research on things like Splenda and its negative impact on gut health. And so I think we need more studies around that, but gut health is also a big buzzword right now. So trying to keep our gut health healthy. Um, I like that the, um, the baking chips, um, the Lily's baking chips do have added um, fiber, soluble fiber to them as well. Um, so they're kind of adding something in to give you a little bit more fiber as like a supplement, um, which is an interesting take on on what they're doing. But um, that definitely can't hurt as well. Well, so. and is winter fiber helps absorb, um, help with the, uh, the slowing the absorption of any of the impact of the carb in there, too? Possibly. Supplemented fiber, I, I would say, um, has a little bit less of that effect, but mm -hmm. um uh, the Lily's chocolates are low in carbs, so the carbohydrates that do come from them are from the soluble fiber that's added back. Um, so you will see carbs in those, but those tend to not really raise blood sugar. Yeah, they're they're kind of they're kind of neutral, correct? Yeah, definitely. 
Correct. So I hope that's not, um, you got Anna and I both to weigh in on that question. Hopefully it wasn't too long of a weigh in, but um, there's just a lot of things to factor with artificial sweeteners, but we definitely, I think at the diabetes care program, really keep up on all the newest literature. So um, when people come see us, you have dietitians, diabetes educator, pharmacists, lots of people that you can um, have weigh in on the most um, evidence-based data. Yeah, it's, the, the, but I want to highlight something that Leah did say, and I, I, then I'll leave this conversation because Easter is coming, um, is that, uh, and this is just my, just putting out there, the sugar-free chocolates, the sugar-free caramels, they're wonderful, they taste great, but they really, you really should keep it to a serving size. And that is um, because they do cause some bloating and GI upset. And I've had in, in my personal experience um, with patients and actually myself, if I eat too much, my tummy gets hurt. My tummy um, hurts. So I'm just kind of putting that out there and they don't, there's no warning on the package. And oftentimes our families find these things for us and they go, oh yay, we can give them candy and it won't hurt them. But you need to do a serving size first to see how that would affect your stomach. So just, you know, this was, this is about spring cooking, but here we go. That was a tip. <laughs> yeah. There's one more um, question around agave nectar. So agave nectar um, is something that still um, will raise your blood sugar. Um, it has um, sugar in it. So you can definitely use that as well if you like the flavor, but um, it will have an impact on blood sugar versus the other ones that we're talking about, like sugar alcohols or um, Splenda or sucralose or um, urethritol really don't have a blood sugar increase effect. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was going to say, sorry, Leah, I was going to say agave nectar, a lot of patients come to me about that. Agave nectar is a natural, it's natural, but I think also so is honey and so is um, maple syrup. I mean, isn't that true, Leah? They're just all from a similar basic, it's a whole food. It's not a bad food, but you have to count the carbs in that food. Yeah, you have to count the carbs. Um, and I, I mean, I really do like to stray away from saying foods are, are good or bad, but right. that definitely is, are foods that are going to spike our blood sugars. So we just want to account for them. Um, somebody is also asking about dates. Um, I mean, dates are higher in fiber, but still have um, sugar in them as well. So you want to account for the carbohydrates. And then just one last thing, and then we can get back to the salmon. I think... Um, Looking at Anna mentions like different holidays with um, artificial sweetener sweets, um, they, st they still can have carbohydrates that raise our blood sugar. I always think about like a pumpkin pie, a sugar-free pumpkin pie or sugar-free apple pie, the flour and the crust and then the apples or the pumpkins can still raise our sugar. So we still want to be um, aware right. depending on the medications we take. It doesn't mean we can't have them, but just to be aware. And in those sugar-free chocolates and caramels, last thing, there are calories. They're not, they're, so they're, they're not zero calories, you know, so just FYI, if you're looking at that aspect. Now that we've um, basically had a second webinar within our webinar, let's talk about the salmon. <laughs> so I will show, oh, it's beautiful, the salmon. And so I put the topping on it. And you can choose to cook. I only cooked some of the salmon with the onion at the end because I don't particularly love a strong onion flavor, but you could put all of the onions underneath and then cook it that way. Um, but you can see the pretty pomegranates. The dill smells amazing. It and does. the orange is really festive and beautiful and will give it that lovely citrus flavor. That's beautiful. Megan, that's amazing. So, our that is our um, spring meal, and um, we hope that you. Um, I hope we've inspired you to go out there to farmers markets or try maybe a new vegetable or fruit or something that you see out there in in the on the produce stand and and see um, see how to make it. Sometimes I like to just go out and go, I don't even know what that is, but I'm going to figure it out and then to go home and find an, uh, a recipe for it. And that's fun. Megan, thank you so much for doing such a great job. You really helped us. <laughs> thank you for having me. This was such a fun project to work on and I hope everyone enjoys the recipes. 
Yeah, okay. thank you all for coming. Um, the recording will be up um, hopefully by tomorrow and the recipes will be up as well. So you have some great recipes to try this weekend. Thank you both. Bye guys. <laughs>